Well, it's good to see you. I feel like I'm doing a 180 degree almost turning of my head to try and see everybody today. We're a bit low on numbers because of the weather. Um, I know sometimes you may feel that my sermons may go on a little bit longer than you would prefer. Not that you've ever told me that, of course. But I spent seven and a half hours at a safeguarding course yesterday, so you are going to be blessed with only 7.4 hour long sermon, all right? <laughs> so there you are. I was out on my prayer walk this morning. I saw a man running with a pair of shorts, no coat, no hat, against the wind. I thought, I'm not going to say, wow, Clive. I thought, you're a nut, mate. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> Right, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, what an extraordinary character Ezekiel is. I've put some details in the notes that I'm not going to refer to here this morning because it's a little bit more technical than I think we need to get into really. But Ezekiel was a man who was part of the exile of the kingdom of Judah, southern part of Israel in effect, round about 597 BC. So the exile would happen from roughly 600 BC onwards through to 586 when the temple was destroyed and everything else. And Ezekiel was in the early deportation of those people going into exile. And he ended up in Babylon with a load of other people. Worst case scenario, you could say. So Ezekiel was very aware of what was going on at home and he was very aware of where he was in Babylon at the time when uh, all the things were going on in his country. Now, my friend Susanna, who I miss greatly, uh, she died a little while ago. She always said to me, Simon, she said, I don't always see God in things. You know, you, you try and see him in whatever. She says, but I have always seen him in his timing. That's what she said to me. Always remember that. And I want to say to you, the timing of God is precise with the person of Ezekiel. In the 30th year, says verse 1, simply when Ezekiel was 30 years old, he was called to do something phenomenal for God. Ezekiel, you see, was actually a priest. He came from a priestly lineage, priestly family, very privileged. He was a priest. That's what he was meant to do. And when you got to the age of 30, that was, that, that was the moment when you got recognition. Suddenly he'd hit the age of recognition. And believe me, Ezekiel was going to need to be recognised with the message he was going to be giving. I'm not saying they always wanted to listen to him, but that was the moment. And he would not have been listened to before the age of 30, because he was a priest in the fullest sense at the age of 30. So there you are, there's Ezekiel, and then, guess what happens? He ends up in Babylon, and the Lord says, Ezekiel, you can't be a priest anymore, because there's no temple, there's no anything. You're in Babylon. So what does the Lord say? He says, Ezekiel, I've got something else for you to do. You're now going to be a prophet, a Navi, a mouthpiece for God. And Ezekiel ends up having this vision. So there you are. Ezekiel's 30 years old. Funny that, same age as Jesus. He was the great high priest, of course. So there he is, the prophet priest. So on the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, yes, I know it's a mouthful, Ezekiel was by the Kibar River. Ezekiel was, like any good priest should be, say that to all the ministers in the world, with his people, down at the river, with the exiles. And he knew them. And they were down there praying and going through some ceremonial washing, I, could, I, I guess you could say. And he's by this river on a day like he's done so many times before, and then the heavens were opened. Literally, the loftiest, highest place of all is open wide before him. It breaks forth, and this man, Ezekiel, has visions of God during what was the fifth year of the exile. Visions of God. And upon him was the hand of the Lord, 
The hand of the great I am, Yahweh God, was upon him, verse 3. A hand of authority, a hand that imparts something, a hand that released the overwhelming experience of God's divine revelation upon him. And then in the midst of it, the word of the Lord comes to Ezekiel. And in all of that, he is given something to say, which goes on for a prophetic ministry of 22 Years And there's you thinking, I was talking for a long time, so there you go. And I'm going to say this, as is always the case with biblical experiences of God, true biblical experiences of God must always have the word of God attached to them. If they do not, they are almost certainly going to be false. And there's a lot of iffy stuff going on. So the word of God is critical. God is his word, the word is God, and he's speaking through Ezekiel. So can you use your imaginations a bit here? Because it's really hard. As he looked during these visions of God, he saw a windstorm coming out of the north, verse 4. But this windstorm was pretty weird, as I'm sure you realise when we read the passage through. Because this windstorm was actually an immense cloud with flashing lightning and enveloped in brilliant light. Can you imagine that? Just imagine that. And this windstorm whirlwind, probably good on a day like today with all our wind blowing around, was perhaps necessary, I don't know, to disperse all blockages, blockages of the mind, blockages of the heart, blockages of life, a perhaps a cleaning thunderous wind so Ezekiel could see the vision that God was going to give him more clearly. That said... God is surrounded by clouds, wind, hailstones and lightning in Psalm 18. But this is dramatic stuff. So I ask you, with our slightly depleted numbers this morning, can you feel the weight of what we are reading, the emotion of it, the passion of it? Maybe it's only me then. Yes, okay, good. All right, let me put it another way. If you were sitting here on a Sunday morning... And this happened to you, what would you do? (laughs) Clive, it works. (laughs) Yeah, well, there you go. The funny thing is lots of people might want a vision of God like this, but they wouldn't want the calling that comes after it. There you are. So there you are. It's a wow moment. Not that I'm into Americanisation very much, but there you are. It's a wow moment. Extraordinary. And the thing is, Ezekiel's the only one getting this vision. Everybody else is just still doing their thing. And he's there at the river. And it's happening. And the centre of the fire looked like glowing metal. Can you imagine that? Dripping kind of glowing hot molten metal, verse 5. And this fire, which, by the way, isn't mentioned at all, suddenly, which appears in the text, was part of the windstorm. However, within the fire, there were these four strange living creatures. And in appearance, they were like a man but they also had four faces. They had a face of a man, face of a lion, face of an ox, face of an eagle, verse 10. And these creatures aren't angels, but they are angelic. And they also had four wings. Two of those wings would cover their body like this, and the other two would stretch upwards like that, and one of those wings would be touching the wing of another one of the living creatures, verse 11. And just like the fire from whence they had come, they were lit, these angelic creatures, with burning coals. They were like lit torches. Fire, holy fire, purity in fire, moved back and forth amongst them, verse 13. And then they sped back and forth as quick as a flash with bright lightning strikes crashing forth, verse 14. Can you imagine that? Pew, 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 all over the place. It'd be extraordinary to have this. And remarkably, they went straight ahead and went wherever the Spirit would go, verse 12. And they never turned as they moved, verse 9. So the Spirit of God was moving in them with his purposes, and they would only do that which God wanted them to do. So ABC, do you know what the name of these creatures are? No, they're not angels. Uh, they are angelic, but there's a special name. Not seraphs. We're getting close. Cherubim. 
Ezekiel 10 gives the game away. He specifies Ezekiel 10, they are cherubim. Never sure about cherubim. I often think cherubim's the plural, but I think cherubs is the plural and cherubim is the singular. So I think that's what it is. A bit strange. And these are the same angelic creatures that stood at the Garden of Eden. They also appear at the Ark of Covenant in, tem- in the temple as images and so forth. And do you know what their job is? They are to simply praise, serve, worship, exalt and adore God endlessly. That's what they do. Imagine that. Endless serving. Endless worship. Extraordinary. Have you ever seen anything that's so amazingly beautiful you don't know how to describe it? Yeah? Anything? I went to uh, Yellowstone Park when we had a bit more money before we had the girls. Notice the phrase. And I tell you, when I got there and I saw some of the things, I just cried. I was absolutely overwhelmed with the creativity of God and therefore him as a creator. Absolutely stunned by it. I'll tell you something else I saw. I was over the, the park at Aston Clinton in my previous haunts and it was a totally cloudy day, thick cloud everywhere. And in this park, there was suddenly a hole that appeared in the clouds. Everywhere, it's thick cloud massive hole in the cloud it must have been about half a mile across and through this hole came all these shafts of light phenomenal i've described it to you but i'm not really i'm described sort of maybe yellowstone but i haven't really so these are the things i can't describe to you how i felt when i got married and i can't describe to you how i felt when i had the girls these are all these things And Ezekiel is describing something that is beyond words, really. And these creatures are for God's worship alone. He made them. These are created beings made purely for God. And Ezekiel's told us these things. Why? So that we might awe our God together. Those weird wheels... You know the wheels in the passage? Weird wheels, wheels within wheels, and wheels that I think are sort of 90 degree to each other, so they're sort of a wheel like that with a wheel like that, sort of, you know, cross-sectioning. The Hebrew word for wheel is ophanim. So I believe, and we've got to be very careful about this, we do not go outside the biblical precedent for this, I believe there are three angelic sort of special creatures. Seraphim, cherubim and the ophanim yeah that's what i think and there obviously there are regular angels as well and these wheels are covered in eyes verse 18 and they sparkle with chrysolite or beryl depending on your translation good old beryl i don't think she's here today and the cherubim spirit went through the wheels and they all moved together and their wings were moving around and there was a crashing, rushing noise, thunderous noise, like the voice of the Almighty, verse 23 to 27, 24, sorry. But here's the extraordinary bit, and I do hope you're feeling a little bit more awestruck than normal. Here's the extraordinary thing. In this image, this vision, Something else happens. Ezekiel sees God's throne. He doesn't see God's face because you can't see God's face and live, but he sees God's throne. And he saw a throne made of sapphire. He saw a throne uh, of, made of beautiful stone. Anyone ever heard of lapis lazuli? Beautiful stone. Sorry? Afghanistan, there you go. So this, this beautiful, beautiful throne was like that. And on this throne was a man glowing like metal, full of fire he was, brilliant light surrounded him, and like a rainbow on a rainy day, so was the radiance around this man. And do you know what I think that is? I think that's Jesus in his pre-human form, sitting right there in his glory. Hallelujah. Wonderful thing. And what amazes me more is this. 
There is a massive expanse over the heads of the cherubim and the ophanim here in this passage, verse 22. An expanse that separates them from God. Why is that? Because I think God is so holy, God is so awesome, so incredible, that even these creatures are not allowed full access to him. That's the awe of God and the extraordinariness of our our God. And notice, please, that when he speaks, they lower their wings in an act of total homage and reverence, because this is the Almighty. And then Ezekiel says this. He sums up all this, this impenetrable stuff, with this statement. And it's one of my favourite statements in the whole Bible, actually. It's kind of a statement of irony. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Verse 28. You get that? An appearance of the likeness. He wasn't even close to really be able to describe the extraordinariness. This is just an appearance and a likeness of, not actually somehow the real thing in its totality. So this is how it is. And what does Ezekiel do? He does this. I haven't done that before in a sermon, but I thought I'd throw it in. (laughs) For those who listen to the recording, I just lay flat on the floor if you wonder what the bang was. He fell face down and heard the voice of one speaking. The very voice of God telling him, Ezekiel, you are my prophet priest and I am telling you, you've got a word to give to the people. And he needed it. He needed this vision for the sake of the calling that he'd been given. I've obviously gone through this passage in detail because it's complicated and I want to draw the strands together. But the only reason I've done it is because I need us today to get really a desire, if nothing else, for being in awe of God. This sermon is called, and this series over the next couple of weeks is called, Rediscovering the Awe of God. And I'm going to be frank about this. I do not think the church in this country has a real awe of God anymore. Do you agree with that? And we need to make sure that we then don't fit into that category. We have got to be a people who have an awe of God. If God is like Ezekiel 1, then I want to say he hasn't changed for one minute. He's exactly the same as he was back in 597 BC. And the Lord would say to his people, I want you to get an awe of me. When we turn up here on a Sunday, we all need to be willing and ready to say, Lord, I will be in awe of you. It doesn't have to necessarily be an emotion, because sometimes we don't have the emotions. But what we do have is our minds and our hearts that need to focus in on who Jesus is based on the truth of the scriptures. And I think it's really important that we do that. You see, the thing is this. This extraordinary God on a throne made out of lapis lazuli calls you his son, calls you daughter. He welcomes you in. And he says, now is the time, my church, to worship. You see, is the church truly in awe of Jesus anymore? And if it isn't, why isn't it? And what's going on about that? We sung earlier on. Funnily enough, when I put this in my notes, I wasn't thinking about the songs that Kyle had chosen this morning, but I suppose it's fairly obvious. Awestruck we fall to our knees. I'm going to be absolutely honest with you. When it says in the Bible, uh, I'm on my knees or I'm flat out on the floor, can I just ask that we don't westernise that to mean I'm kneeling down in my heart or something. It meant literally on the floor. That's what it meant. And I tell you the truth, if there is never a time in your life or mine where we are physically flat out on the floor before God, as we see him as he is and believe him to be as he is, then I think something needs adjusting somewhere. We must decrease that he might increase. John 3.30 
You see, awe relates to wonder, wonderment, amazement, astonishment, admiration, reverence, veneration, respect, trepidation, surprise and fear. That's what awe is about. And we have got to make sure that if, if of any church in this area, I want to make sure that we really do worship the Lord. And we will be abandoned and to him, joyfully abandoned, even if we use our song from earlier, and we will have at all of him and it will involve songs but actually it's more than songs it's about lives surrendered it's about being willing to do this even if we're on our own and there's no music playing i think god's calling us to depth really this is our act of loving to use the words from a phrase a little while ago like mary at his feet looking up at him in awe of who he is you see, just to wrap it up really, our God is unlike the Babylonian gods. He is not restricted to one location like they were. The four faces of the cherubim tell me that God is in all directions. He is limitlessly extends into all places at all times. Indeed, in ancient thinking, they would also associate specific constellations with those four directions of north, east, south and west. And so I want to say God is also the God of the stars, God of the universe. That's who he is. And the wheels, the offering were full of eyes. So our God sees everything. He is omnipotent, omnipresent and omniscient, to use our special words. That's who our God is, ABC. Surely we can be in awe of someone like that, can't we? And the other thing is this. As the exiles were sitting there in Babylon in exile, sitting there and struggling away, they probably were thinking to themselves, my God, Yahweh, has been defeated because he's there, he was there, he hasn't got us out of this place. But you know, the truth is this. Yahweh the Lord had not been defeated by the demonic gods nor had he turned away from his people in Israel. He remained seated on his throne at the centre of his domain, the entire cosmos. That's why we have to keep falling down on our feet so that we are in awe of him. In closing, I am convinced that the greater our awe of God is, the greater the sense of God's presence will be because he will do something in response to the praises of his people and then the greater his empowering will be from that for what he asks us to do. Where his people awe him, then I believe the miracles will follow and flow. Because at that time, when we're truly awing him, we will see word and spirit together in perfect balance. Not some iffy spirituality, not some dodgy word, but true biblical truth with the Holy Spirit moving. The name Ezekiel means this, God strengthens. And so may we be strengthened by God. May we truly experience the Yehezekiel, Yahweh's strength. Praise be to his name today. Amen. <laughs>